I'll give a little update on James Jones because we've had some um, reasonably big news recently. Um, as you know, we've been around 180 years, over 180 years in the timber business and a good chunk of that in Aberdeenshire in the northeast. And as a group, we've always been involved in harvesting and sawmilling. But today we're involved in t engineered timber, pallets and packaging. We own a wind farm. We have an equity share in Scottish Woodlands. We make potato boxes and we make collars for pallets um, for the engineering industry. And just recently, last week, we bought uh, GT Timber, Taylor Made and Kerr in North East England and South Scotland. So today we have 25 sites across the UK. The um, seven sites there are sawmills in green, um, showing the two new sites, at GT Timber at Durham and Allen our three sawmills in the northeast and our sites at Lockerbie, as well as our pallet sites and manufacturing and repair around the country, timber systems up in Forres and our head office at Larbert. Um, our sawmill production has grown consistently over the last 30, 40 years since the modern sawmills came in from Sweden. And you'll see this year with the addition of GT Timber into the group will produce over 800,000 cubic metres of sawn timber with a log requirement just under 1.4 million tonnes of logs. Hey, can I interrupt this now? I don't think your screen share is working from this end. All right. Did you not see any of that? No, no, we're, we're, uh, we're seeing you and Stephen all. Okay. I will just go back and try and reshare it, Will. I don't know why that's not working. I don't know who does that. Yeah, that's the one. Can you see it there? Yes, no. Okay. Yeah, so just most of you will have heard most of that, but I'll just run quickly through the slides. So just our involvement in the timber industry. The group today showing the harvesting, the engineered timber, pallets and packaging, sawmilling and wind farm, Scottish woodlands. Our sites around the UK, so the sawmill sites and the sites up in the northeast and the new GT timber sites at Durham and Annan and all our pallet wood sites around the country. And our sawn production today, which will be 800,000 cubic metres. As we're in the northeast, or at least virtually, um, I'm concentrating a little bit on the on the northeast here. Um, as many of you know, we've invested over seven million in the um, redevelopment of our Aboyne sawmill, which you see on the slide here. In addition to that, We've also put in very much of the theme of this evening, a new biomass boiler um, with an electrostatic filter, which filters out particulates, but also gives us a wider range of fuel use, which could in include um, forest residues. And also on the carbon theme, we're investing in mini bundling, very much for Scottish product, to actually sell more wood in Scotland and re reduce timber miles. And Stephen will come back to that in the presentation. We're also doing a lot on the access to the site, um, improving safety and workplace transport. At our other mill in the north at Stoglock, we've committed to a mill redevelopment project over the next four to five years. And this will double capacity initially in our sawn output and run, roundwood requirement. And along with the 30% increase in the demand for a boyne, and also this demand at Stoddock, we're looking for considerably more wood over the next 30, 40, 50 years, also very relevant in this discussion. We're, we've invested in a protein plant specifically for the Scottish market, once again for 
local sales to reduce carbon um, output and, and um, timber miles. And this is scaled up for a new mill for the future, as is our biomass plant, a 2.5 megawatt <coughs> biomass plant to replace the gas boiler that's on site and again reduce our carbon footprint. And I think that leads me quite quickly on to Stephen Craig and his presentation on carbon. Thank you very much, David. I'm never sure if I'm Stan or Ollie as part of this double act, but maybe you can make up your own mind. Um, I have to say, when I heard from Will the, the title of tonight's um, uh, evening regarding carbon, I think it's I, I felt rather instead of Stan or Ollie, I feel a bit like Bob Mortimer being asked to present a fly fishing masterclass. But anyway, let's see how we go. With, with headline, this is James Jones in the carbon economy. So let's get back to basics. What do we do? We harvest timber, we transport it. We produce a range of timber products. We deliver that to our customers. They in turn do various things, including building houses, fences, and pallets. But critically, in doing that, we also offer enough knowledge that they know the exact carbon negative footprint of the timber they are using. So that's that's important. It's a theme we'll, we'll come back to. And then at the end of life of that cycle of timber, hopefully we're ready to harvest some new um, trees. Sitka today, goodness knows what in 45 years time. But um, that's our process. Now it's James Jones in the carbon economy, but I think that applies equally to our fellow timber processors and pretty much anyone in Europe. So. A lot of what we're trying to do tonight is present a perspective from James Jones on carbon. However, I hope it has resonance with most other UK and European wood processors. Okay. So one of the areas of carbon, and as, as Will said in his introduction, it's a hot topic, it's a growing topic, and one that there's a sufficient amount of confusion around to try and spend the next five, ten minutes unpicking some of that confusion as best we can. So one way of looking at carbon is through the UK uh, Woodland Carbon Code. Most of you will be familiar with it, but it's worth reminding ourselves what it was set up to do. It was set up to bridge a funding gap for new afforestation schemes that weren't financially viable, would not have gone ahead without additional support. So it was a means of bridging that gap from 2011 onwards to help landowners finance through the issuance of carbon credits, and we'll come back to that in a, in a second, and be able not only to generate carbon credits, but also to sell those carbon credits. It's therefore beneficial in helping meeting national targets. It's for new woodland creation only, just to be clear on that. Very good, it's a very good scheme. Those of you who've never had the opportunity to speak to anyone in Woodland Carbon Crowd, if you speak to Bruce Octorlone or Vicky West, you'll receive a warm welcome and a very knowledgeable welcome. Very high standards, robust science, a transparent registry, backed up by independent validation and verification. So a couple of points from that. I don't like using acronyms without at least explaining them once. So here's your here's your one and only chance. Two types of acronym, pending issue and unit. So it's a promise to deliver carbon at the end of the period of sequestration. There's no guarantee with them. And if you buy a PIU as a future, you cannot then immediately make statements. You've got to couch your statements in terms of commitment to future sequestration, plans to be net zero by year, 2021 plus 45 or plus 30 or plus 90. So it's very important to, to try and understand the difference between a PIU and a woodland carbon unit. And they're the units which are delivered through the life of the project. So there's not a lot of carbon being sequestered when a tree is 30 centimeters tall, but as the trees grow, sequestration grows accordingly. So it's the actual measured sequestration. It's a guaranteed number, it's a guaranteed figure. And it can be used as that magic and often misused term as offset or compensation. But if you have a woodland carbon unit, you may apply an offset. So that's the basics of what we're now going to talk around. 
So the very basics, so new woodland carbon to the woodland carbon code, existing woodlands are excluded. So if you think of the slides David's just shown on James Jones, the vast, vast bulk, 99 point odd percent of our logs coming in are no, not currently fall under the woodland carbon code because despite the best efforts of our harvesting managers and Neil Cowan, we very rarely buy 11 year old trees or 10 year old trees at the moment. And as I say, woodland carbon, they can be, the woodland carbon units can be accrued based on sequestration. The projects are scored on set criteria under UK forest standard and within a verified um, long-term forest management plan. Critically at the moment, commercial schemes will garner over say a 45 year period between 13,000 and 20,000 tonnes of woodland carbon units per 100 hectares. Native broadlands will do one and a half times that, 30,000 perhaps more. However, that's over a longer period. So you're not comparing apples with apples. You've got 45 years for your commercial, over 100 for your native. Obviously the risk on native, and yes, I can hear some of you saying a sawmiller would say this, you introduce a greater degree of risk such as disease, and you're also in effect over that 100 year period missing out on two timber sales, which if my limited commercial savvy is, is right at the moment, logs are reasonably valuable. And as I say, the woodland carbon units and PIUs are marketable as futures. Current prices vary between seven twenty uh, pounds a ton, um, but actually are only delivered on maturity as, as woodland carbon units. The key issues of concern at the moment surround additionality. Additionality is a term referred to that requires the project to demonstrate that without the benefit of the woodland carbon code credits, without that financial support, the project would not have gone ahead. So it's a buffer to use to ensure that the planting targets are met. And the fact that it's limited to new planting only confuses and dismays a number of people. I think most of us understand the rationale for the carbon code. But obviously, as I've said above, there is a basis, a bias towards native. And the concerns that we have generally are not concerns that are the fault of the carbon code. It's more a fault of those who don't quite understand what the carbon code stands for. And because of that, or a willingness or an unwillingness to understand the code and its limitations, we often see inaccurate offset claims, the concern that larger businesses may use PIUs um, as a, a method for business as usual. So in effect, you're turning your sequestered carbon in a log into, for example, jet fuel to burn out the back of a jumbo. So these are all current concerns with regard to Woodland Carbon Code. However, it's very important, the Carbon Code. It helps address the climate emergency. It helps greatly to achieve our long for 30,000 hectare annual planting target. It verifies under the publicly available standard for carbon neutrality. It is based on good, robust science, based on forest research, UK forestry standard, etc. It involves UCAS accredited bodies such as the Soil Association to track the lifetime of that project over 45, 95, 105 years. So it tracks issuance, ownership, transfer and use of the PIUs and woodland carbon units. And as we all know, under um, UK Forestry Standard and UQUIS, there are many wider benefits that are attractive to buyers in the market. And critically, it should tie in with what we hope is in the UK Environment Bill with regard to net gain requirements. So we are very supportive, although wary of the slight misunderstanding that certain um, individuals, organisations, investment funds have with regard to Woodland Carbon Code. So if we just bring that back, just jump on gone too far. That's it. So we just bring it back to James Jones quickly. Uh, James Jones currently on five and a half thousand hectares. We'd like to target two and a half thousand new hectares by 2025. Tilly Rye we use just outside Kinross principally because it's a hundred hectares so it makes even our sawmillers basic arithmetic fairly manageable. So in this case we've managed to garner around 16,000 tons of carbon equivalent over the next 45 years. We're not going to sell PIUs. We would caution anybody in the market in, as landowner investor 
perhaps there is a natural buyer of your carbon, namely the person who buy your log, who's tied into people who have a range of requirements to benefit from that timber. Our target equates to 400,000 tonnes. Where do we see that? We see it as potential offset for James Jones in the future, and more likely the majority of that 400,000 tonnes being used for client offset, i.e. timber buyer offset. So if we continue that story through, we typically ensure through our strategy, our strategy is a grand title for uh, common sense, chain of custody. Through Aquas, we have the benefit of PEFC and FSC accreditation, and we know where our logs are coming from because we should do. So that's the basis of everything we do. We then ensure environmental compliance through 14001. And then the icing on the cake, which is now turning into a thicker and thicker portion of icing, is our carbon accounting and an environmental product declaration. So what do we mean by that? Very simply, we emit two and a half bits of carbon per unit of timber output. We've estimated or calculated there's about six bits of carbon per unit already stored in our log. The result is we still have three and a half bits of carbon, whether it's a cubic meter or a linear meter in this instance is irrelevant. So we still have the majority of the carbon locked after we've put in all our effort. What do we mean by all our effort? What we're talking about is planting, harvesting, transportation, all the processing, secondary processing. We do more and more kiln drying, timber treatment as a percentage of output. And then we require independent data validation. So for every part of our business, whether it's timber systems, whether it's sawmill, whether it's pallets, we, we pay about 30 to 35,000 pounds for independent validation. At the moment, we use primarily Ricardo. We have a very good working relationship with, with that company. And that is able to spit out interesting figures such as if we sell you as a timber buyer 5,000 cubic meters of timber supplied to your gate, we can tell you that there's 3,000 tons of carbon locked in there, not as a woodland carbon unit, not as a PIU, but as scientifically sequestered carbon. So just to finish up, timber products leading into what Matt's going to talk about, they attract a net carbon score in various BRE type scoring ratings, local authority scoring ratings, particularly if you're able to show you lock that timber up in construction. Construction is a significant end use in terms of percentage of our output, but not the whole story. We have a lot of fencing material, for example. So that score is based on the overall net score, and the scoring is based on this assessment, as I've said, on life cycle assessment and environmental product declaration. And the critical part of this slide is the second two, last two bullet points. The UK EPD, so whether it's James Jones, whether it's Norboard, whether it's any other modern processing, uh, timber processing company, if they've done an EPD, EPD, it will verify that the majority of the carbon, for 60% plus, if you, if you want to know the, the broad, broad brush figure, 60% plus of the carbon in equivalent terms remains locked within the timber after a cradle to gate energy input have been deducted. So this is our USP. We've no need to overclaim, we've no need to double claim, and we've no need to confuse our clients. Are we in danger of overclaiming? Are we in danger of double claiming? Are we in danger of confusing clients? I would argue, yes, yes, and probably we already have. But what is undoubted is that we have an extremely strong hand. The UK has a strong hand in relation to import material. And of course, timber has a strong hand in relation to plastic, aluminium, steel, concrete. And it's imperative we retain that benefit in discussing and developing this very new 10-year-old woodland carbon code and the competing requirements of corporate social responsibility for our main timber buyers and those who don't have any involvement in timber whatsoever. So we don't want to lose that benefit, we want to retain the benefit and use that to continue to develop, to develop our modern forestry processing sector. So when we get it right, we can do nice smart things. If, if you want to design a house, we'll design it for you using timber and we'll tell you not roughly how much timber is entrapped, embodied, contained within that design. We'll tell you exactly how much and we'll be able to demonstrate that as third party verified. 
And then finally, it's just a reminder, we're all very focused on carbon, but the EPD plays out beyond carbon to energy, to biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. And no matter where we look, whether it's um, our wonderful drainage systems, energy capture, innovations in transport and harvesting and sawmilling efficiency as kilowatt hours per cubic meter, we've got a great story to tell. Whether you're Chef or any other timber buyer, our sector marries up to CSR requirements beautifully. So that's the key for us. And I just want to finish with a quick video. David introduced James Jones as managing director as a company with a long-term history of innovation. So we just want to show you a quick, quick look at what we're doing on innovation, very quick look at what we're doing, but please note the emphasis on carbon throughout. Works. Time to cut it. So th thanks very much for that. It's obviously a quick run through, but hopefully try to separate the, the, the two main sources of, of carbon claim. But please note, CONFOR is currently looking at this issue, as you might imagine, gathering together um, sector knowledge and in terms of developing and providing an in-house carbon resource for the industry. So if you can bear with us, um, hopefully CONFOR will be able to add that to the list of services it currently provides to members. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, that was a, a good um, a run through once we've actually got the, uh, the technology sorted out. Um, thankfully, we've got better carbon information there perhaps than, uh, than technology. Um, but uh, that's very good. Uh, thank you also for pointing out the section at the end about uh, the work that Comfort is embarking on as far as uh, trying to pull together some of the information on um, carbon. Uh, I think it's important that from a sector point of view, we do try to get some sort of baseline information on there. Uh, and certainly that's work in progress, as you pointed out. If we can move on to uh, our second um, presentation of the night, and uh, if I can introduce Mark Stevenson, uh, who's the, uh, the founder and managing director of Ecosystems Technologies, and he'll uh, give us the, the, the next step onwards in utilization uh, of timber uh, and uh, look at the uh, perspective from his viewpoint on carbon and off-site manufacture. Mark, Great. Great, thanks very much. I'll check quickly that you can see my uh, first opening slide, hopefully. Yes, absolutely, spot on. Great, <laughs> thanks very much. So, uh, you know, great to, 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 to follow on and, and sort of, uh, put a, 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 um, a, a construction uh, uh, sort of focus on this. Um, so I'm, I'm Matt Stevenson. Uh, I'm uh, founder, managing director of Ecosystems Technology. We're an innovative prop tech company. Um, and we're de dedicated to digital transformation in the construction industry, to applied innovation in timber technology, uh, and to the democratization of sustainable, healthy buildings. Uh, just to give you, you know, a bit of a flavour of, uh, of uh, sort of my background, you know, the, the following couple of slides are a series of uh, exciting, innovative projects that previously delivered. Um, with a, an a absolute uh, focus on, uh, on on a timber approach and a sustainable build system approach. Um, you can see the uh, the Dyson project here with some significant uh, engineering challenges uh, with cantilevering pods at all sorts of angles. Um, uh, the next slide you can see a, a mixture of social housing projects, um, five-star holiday rental uh, cottages, 
um, digitally enabled assisted living homes, but you know that that the equality of being able to have the same build system for a, a, a social housing uh, project as for a very high uh, high end uh, build build solution. So I want to focus on uh, on from from a sort of wider industry perspective, not just from an ecosystems perspective. Uh, you know we have. Uh, a, a huge challenge that the construction industry accounts for approximately 60% of UK material use and the industry generates 47% of the UK's carbon emissions, 80% of those are from buildings in use. So a significant challenge when we think in terms of the, the climate crisis um, and you know we have, we need to think of the carbon crisis in terms of a, a remaining carbon budget that we have um, and everything on this graph that you can see above the line is sort of business as, as usual where we have a significant investment of carbon when a when a building is initially built and then further investment of carbon over over the lifespan of that building uh, in any in any other form of uh, of investment uh, this, this wouldn't stack up and we will be bankrupt because we will have reached a uh, a tipping point and um, environmental crisis uh, catastrophe will follow um, in contrast to that, and as an antidote to that, if we if we're deliberate about using biogenic materials um, and principally timber, of course, uh, is our uh, is our best option in that, then we can reverse that effect. So, you know, below the line, we're seeing uh, the, a carbon um, sequestration uh, at the at the point of build, and furthermore, in operation, uh, we 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 can achieve with that really fabric first and timber first approach we can achieve a very high performance building so our energy in use will also be uh, have a positive effect environmentally and of course we're showing this on a 60 years lifespan but critically we need to be looking well beyond that and uh, of course if we design uh, for manufacturing assembly and disassembly and reuse then we can extend that life 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 uh, cycle uh, far far further into the future um, what you know? What does that look like from a from a sort of a development perspective? So, um, another company that I'm involved with that can help co-found is uh, called Synergy, and uh, we are evolving the future of living through a, um, a a a rental a rental model where your rent, your uh, energy, and your mobility is wrapped into one subscription model. So, the solar panels on this on this entire development. Uh, capture energy through a community energy storage system using battery storage. Uh, there's zero car ownership. It's all shared mobility through uh, through electric vehicles that, that, that are on a subscription basis. Obviously, this works best in a sort of close to urban location, not uh, not so much uh, in, in in Highland where I am out in the countryside. But this is you know this is you know so much of the future of of, uh, of housing and uh, accommodation is going to be in in more urban environments. So one one development like this um, using four and a half thousand cubic meters of timber will sequester three, just shy of three and a half thousand tons of carbon conventionally built uh, with, with you know, non-timber sort of focused materials, you know, uh, concrete build and steel build would an, emit nearly 2000 tons. And the net, the net benefit, um, and I know the figures don't quite add up, but taking into account some, some of the other uh, carbon emitted in the, in the process of building that are sustainable build, um, will uh, will the net difference is about four and a half thousand uh, tons um you know so what what we want to do so take you know uh, look, looking at what we're looking to be able to do we've got these carbon pools within the, the sort of forestry ecosystem um how much of that can can we can we transfer in, in, into construction and in transferring that into construction how much of that can we, you know, how intelligently can we can we design? So if we're designing for manufacturing assembly and disassembly and reuse, then we get uh, an extremely positive impact. You know, t timber without uh, con con considering the reuse and end of life scenarios, you know, it has has far less effect than if we if we do it with with the uh, you know with future repurposing in mind. So we're 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 holding that carbon in in uh, in the carbon life cycle much longer. Uh, obviously, composite and concrete, uh, you know, uh, achieve far far less performance. But wh where that, you know, where that ha has has further relevance is is because that means that the effect of 
of growing and harvesting and growing and harvesting, we, we, we start to achieve a cumulative effect because we're holding that and sequestering that carbon uh, for, for, you know, for a much longer uh, period of time. Um, so, so this slide um, was showing, you know, is what what we have uh, as a real strength in this battle is a, uh, is a strategic uh, convergence and uh, convergence. Uh, it would be nice if the E was on the same line, but uh, apologies for that. But uh, we have, but we do have this strategic convergence which we can which we, uh, we can build upon, and that that's a combination of you know. So we've got offsite manufacturing companies, and all the companies shown within here uh, form uh, form part of Offsite Solutions Scotland, uh, you know, consortium of offsite manufacturers with a timber focus. Uh, Collect coming together to to really uh, try try to have as as strong a strategic uh, response to the opportunities within the market as possible. We have um, we have the, the the forest products. So of course you know James James Jones have just just spoken. We've got all, all of the, you know the other uh, sawmillers uh, represented there. We have. We have the value add sort of side of, of that that of the industry, uh, where we're adding adding value to to those materials, and of course we've got you know key strategic stakeholders, and where where we need to be is where all of these different uh, different key stakeholders are working to 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 a shared purpose of adding value to the homegrown product and uh, moving it uh, up the, up the carbon cycle. Um, so we've got Offsite Solutions Scotland is a, is that really strong consortium uh, of offsite manufacturers. We've also got the Mass Timber Alliance, which has come, you know, evolved from from uh, from this ecosystem uh, established by Scottish Forestry, Construction Scotland Innovation Centre in Edinburgh Napier, and bringing together, you know, a whole host of uh, stakeholders who are committed to looking at how we can evolve uh, a mass timber solution, and that solution needs to uh, take account of uh, of the, the material which we have uh, within uh, within Scotland. So I'll just try and play play this animation. Um, uh, I'll just pause it for a second. So um, so bringing all of that together, uh, we're, we're looking to establish the biogenic offsite manufacturer uh, accelerator. Um, so a bit of a mouthful, but very very uh, very impactful. So um, this is a, a collaboration between uh, Edinburgh Napier University. Uh, uh, Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, New Model Institute of Technology and Engineering, uh, and ourselves as eco uh, ecosystems being the really commercial accelerator within the mix. Um, and it's our belief uh, that Scotland has the renewable resource, the internationally recognised expertise and the te technical capabilities necessary to be at the forefront of a new approach to delivering a sustainable built environment in response to the climate crisis. Leveraging this potential, Scotland can deliver the human capital and the necessary built assets uh, required to form the fabric of a circular economy. Digitally, uh, digit, sorry, digitally enabled, uh, these assets will in, instigate an ecosystem of organic growth, unlocking the potential of a currently stagnating sector in the midst of a skills crisis that on a global level is a major contributor to climate change. So we're proposing a strategic convergence of the renewable resource, so forestry, woody, biomass, and uh, all of which, uh, all of that naturally replenishable material and resource, um, and, and bring that together with the construction sectors to enable a new model for the sustainable manufacture of the built environment. This new model will be capable of evolving to meet the needs of future generations without impinging upon the uh, upon uh, the available resources. And you know we'll be able to offer a better quality of life aligned with the sustainable development goals. We'll create through this. We'll create economic growth, providing jobs and wealth creation in remote and rural communities. We'll be able to instigate startups and secure the long-term success of currently established organisations by enabling scale in a market currently attracting major investment. This will ensure a resilient Scottish construction sector that is less reliant on imported resource and correspondingly less at the mercy of price, price fluctuations due to the global supply and demand cycles. Um, so uh, I'll, 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 I'll go on and talk, talk a little bit more about you know, what, what, we're going, what we're looking to achieve uh, as, this, uh, uh, as this consortium. And it's, uh, hopefully I can get past this slide. Uh, Bear with me. This is where I suspect I am. I'll be too impatient and fly past it. But um, 
Yeah. Bear me two seconds. Uh, bring up the next slide and go back into present mode. Um, right. Hopefully you should be able to see that any second. But what the next slide shows um, is a, a, a bit a, a bit of the whole uh, the whole life cycle that we're looking at. So um, I won't go into too much detail on this, but uh, what what we're looking at is is just what this looks to describe is a digital thread which flows from literally from the forest floor um, all the way through to the living room floor. And what we, what we have, you know, we've got fantastic. Um, in, integrated supply chain within the, 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 the sawmilling industry. So we can understand uh, that, that raw material uh, and we can understand its properties and its characteristics. Uh, we can use those to, to create you know, a, a digital twin of the, uh, and a virtual product, which we can then virtually manufacture and actually physically manufacture. Uh, and what that allows us to do is build and, and, and deliver efficiency uh, through all of those processes. Um, uh, lock lock in learnings and cycle back learnings. And what we want to see uh, at the end of this process is that we uh, have resulting physical assets, i.e. the built environment uh, project that's delivered, uh, and in balance with that, a digital asset. So we want, you know, we want the two things to coexist and for our end customer um, to be the custodian, uh, not only of the physical asset, but of the digital asset. And in doing that, that we, we can uh, have a virtuous uh, virtuous cycle all the way back to the forest floor so that can help inform planting regimes for the future and uh, and, and ensure maximum uh, uh, effectiveness so it would be wonderful if the slide moved forwards um, it's the uh, trouble with trying to uh, embed too many videos I'm sure um, so just to recap then on, on on what that you know what that looks like so um, we've We've, we've 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 we're taking the 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 the, um, the the forest product all the way through this cycle where we're uh, we're looking to move that homegrown product up the value chain and that's through de delivering homegrown versions of existing products and in tandem with that and importantly innovating the development of new products and understanding our our local resource in in innovating and uh, applying that uh, that knowledge to new products. Um, and and, and we'll, we apply a five capitals approach. So taking into consideration physical, natural, social, human and financial capitals and making sure that there's a balance between those key ingredients um, and responding to industry drivers. So sustainability, culture, productivity, regulation, digitization and skills. And the result, is, if we do this well, is that we have enhanced systems, uh, factory formed, uh, which add further value, and that's by optimizing product family architectures and and creating uh, products that that really are are designed for for to, to uh, most optimally respond to the end application. Um, so we're going to we're going to demonstrate uh, the, this uh, by delivering a series of what we're describing as living lab projects, where we can properly capture um, that knowledge and learning. So let let, let me just tell you a, a bit about uh, a couple of couple of example projects for that. So um, we're just in the process of, of manufacturing the, the, the UK's first homegrown mass timber uh, building. Uh, so it's so we've uh, done the trial manufacture of the Synergy demonstrator. So you, uh, you saw the uh, the courtyard development earlier. This is essentially we plucked one of those uh, one of those one of the two bed uh, two story apartments out of that, and we're manufacturing that as two pods. So we've taken homegrown fiber, uh, uh, dried down to twelve percent moisture content. We've at the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre's innovation factory. We've manufactured that into a combination of cross laminated timber uh, panels for the walls, nail laminated timber panels for the ceilings. And I'd note that the nails in this are actually made of beech. Um, so it is genuinely an all timber product. Um, we've made uh, glue laminated timber uh, panels for the floors and, and a new product called uh, glue, which we're describing as a glue laminated timber portal, um, uh, which, uh, which responds to the need of the, this, this particular project. And I, I think, you know, it's a, a key, key point again is, you know, we, we're able to produce that product, understanding the resource that we have available to us and looking to, uh, to, to, to not just create a commodity, but create a, a product that, that res responds optimally to that. Um, 
Let me see if I can move forwards again. This is where impatient, impatience kicks in again. Sorry. Uh, so the that Synergy uh, uh, demonstrator we're going to exhibit at COP26. So, you know, put that onto the global global stage and really sort of um, use that as a platform uh, for, for, for everything that we're, we're looking to achieve with that unit. Um, so we've got the digital twin of the unit. Um, we've got the, we're delivering that through the innovate, innovative manufacturing process. In tandem with the physical unit on site at COP26, we'll have an augmented reality version of that product. So we'll have the physical and we'll have an augmented reality overlay on that. So essentially, somebody visiting with a smartphone will be able to download uh, a demo app and they'll be able to peel back the, certain, the layers of that unit and really see and understand better what that's about. And we can tell the, you know, the carbon story through that uh, augmented reality sort of tool set. It also means I can take that away and you know, further understand and evolve it. And again, you know, that's just referring back to what that will look like. So this, you know, this, this is then um, a, a, a prototype for then rolling out uh, at scale. Um, so exciting prospect, uh, we believe, for, for the future of that. Uh, another project which I think you know, brings together the, 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 um, the circular economy, whole, whole life cycle piece, the, dig, you know, the relevance of, of digitization on this is our near home project. Um, so we're, we're working at the moment on a, pro, a project funded by Scottish Government through uh, Transport Scotland uh, in collaboration with Construction Scotland Innovation Centre and a number of other um, stakeholders to, to, to develop a product which can enable people to live uh, to, to work closer to home. So as we as we emerge from the pandemic, um, people don't default back to uh, commuting. And especially since the, those commutes would li likely be back, you know, get, getting back into cars rather than on, onto public transport because of uh, you know, concerns of, of, of the virus. So um, so, you know, that 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 solution can could be a booth within somebody's existing home so that they can convert a an existing room into a workplace it could be a pod uh, in in the garden it could be a hub within a green space you know locally within the the um within the village town or, or, or parts of the city uh, or it could be you know at a community level um so for example we the the, the first project uh is we've been tasked to take a vacant um, retail space within East Kilbride Shopping Centre and convert it uh, in, in, into a near home office space. And what you can see on the right here is, uh, is a, an early render of what that will look like. And you can see lots of nice homegrown uh, exposed timber products uh, on the walls and ceilings and the glue laminated timber portal frame, uh, that new product uh, used as the framework for this. But importantly, what that is, is a build system that's independent of the existing building structure, um, can be adapted and changed over time. It's a kit of parts that's pre predetermined um, so, such that it can be it can be uh, adapted to, to meet changing needs. It can be disassembled and reassembled elsewhere and uh, and ultimately uh, disassembled into its constituent parts. So, you know, a very, very extended life cycle and multiple uses uh, rather than what would be the, the, the typical thing of a short duration fit out of a space like that with materials which then end up uh, ultimately largely in landfill. From a digital perspective, we want our end user following on from this. We want this to be uh, available on a to, to a to a wide market, um, and for people to be able to take a, the the digital platform, uh, select uh, components from 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 a three D library using their phone, scan the space, you know, actually do a, an augmented reality uh, uh, preview of the unit on in sight. Use use that uh, to do live configuration to change and adapt the uh, the design to to to, to meet uh, individual needs and to respond to site constraints. Um, the output of that being to to generate the design for manufacturing and uh, manufacturing assembly information. So it'll be a direct you know all of that all of the sort of metadata that sits behind the model will mean that that's that's spat out without any any intervention from a from a designer uh, potentially that could go through a digital manufacturing process you know at a local local facility and using of course you know uh, locally produced materials wherever possible and 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 whilst you know we we would ideally supply um kit parts uh, components uh, it would be possible for the for individual end users to uh, to assemble those using uh, augmented reality and uh, uh, digital uh, assembly guidance. Um, 
so uh, you know and that that all sounds uh, possibly a bit fan, fan, uh, fan, fanciful and fantastic but actually it, we we will have um, we'll have a prototype demonstration of that uh, within within the next few months so um, exciting times ahead uh, th throughout all of this I'll, I'll finish just with an image of uh, of some of those uh, near home uh, workspaces set within a you know a, a tranquil environment um, so you know hopefully we can look forward to uh, post uh, post pandemic uh, to 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 an, a future where we can really leverage and make the most of uh, of our carbon and of our natural and natural and uh, locally produced materials thanks very much for that I hope it was of some use. Thanks, Mark. Um, that was uh, a, a very good run through and some really uh, interesting concepts in there. Uh, I particularly like the, uh, the the reference to post pandemic because it has been something which is, uh, has interested me really in how people are going to react um, in the work environment uh, after uh, we've spent the majority of a year home working. Uh, I'm sure that some people will be very keen to get a pod in their garden, uh, if nothing else other than to get away from the uh, the pressures of uh, homeschooling and um, uh, and domestic life. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's definitely some mileage in that, I think. Uh, Jamie, can I possibly hand across to you if you have some uh, questions uh, that you want to um, bring forward? Thank you, Will, and uh, thanks. Um, Stephen and David and, and, and Matt for um, some absolutely fascinating um, presentations. It, it the more the more just like you said at the beginning, Will. The more the more we hear about the, the carbon story, the the the, the more we realise the less that we understand about it all. Um, we had some. Uh, uh, I'd just like to repeat what uh, Stephen said towards the end of his presentation, drawing attention to the fact that CONFOR is very well aware that uh, forestry uh, and timber sectors need to get their act together in um, presenting a more coherent picture of what we, what our sector can deliver. And that is now work in progress. And um, it will be try to address um, some of the more um, awkward questions that we've received, such as from the chief forester herself, um, asking um, uh, 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 about um, uh, the, the um, no, 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 I can't find her, her question, her, um, the, 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 relating to soil carbon losses that occur in the, in the changes from um, moorland to woodland and things like that. However, um, Realising that time is not on our side, um, I, I have picked out a, a few questions. And um, for, for starters, uh, Matt, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, Michael Bruce has raised in the chat the questions of um, how can we account for um, the carbon in, in embedded in existing buildings and in retrofit um, uh, um, you know, exercises. Yeah, yeah. No, a, a very, very relevant question, and yeah, I, I haven't got the stat to hand, but uh, there's a, there's a very high percentage of uh, future buildings have already been built. You know, if we look back in in 20 years, you know, the majority of buildings already exist. So, so there's a real emphasis on being able to improve the performance of of existing buildings, and I think you know, biogenic uh, materials and you know, timber timber uh, and wood fiber uh, materials can can play a significant role in that. And I know there's there's a, a number of exciting projects which are looking looking at doing that. I suppose to you know, the near our near home. Uh, uh, example is hopefully a good good reference point for that because we are looking to take uh, existing the, you know there'll be a, a real change in the dynamics of how buildings are used post pandemic so there'll be a lot of vacant buildings uh, that whose original purpose is no longer entirely relevant um, so how can we how can we re reimagine and reinvent those? And, and that that system that we've described there is designed exactly for that purpose. And 
to be able to change again you know so so you know th those dynamics of, of current priorities will change change continue to change no doubt so you know if we can design uh, the new buildings that, that are intelligently designed for, for future repurposing but also come up with systems that 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 may harness and make use of uh, of existing buildings and don't waste the embodied ca carbon uh, that, that already exists there is a valuable resource. Um, so, uh, so yeah, ho hopefully that gives you a, a bit of a, a bit of sight of what some of those solutions could could look like. But it is a absolutely key key question to to raise. So thank you. It does occur to me that um, we we are getting better and better at establishing the. Um, uh, uh, how, how well forestry itself does, but yet we are not, um, uh, uh, there's no way of rewarding um, us for really for the timber in the buildings themselves in, in, in the future. And maybe that's something we can, we can look at. Anyway, get, get, going back to the opposite end of, uh, of, the, of the cycle, there were several questions about um, whether um, there's any likelihood of carbon payments becoming available on existing woodland or what would be the best way of rewarding um, forest owners for the capture generated by the, the forests. Uh, perhaps one for Stephen and David, yeah, thanks, Jamie. I think obviously the point we made was that the Woodland Carbon Code is in its infancy. It's only 10 years old. Um, so in effect, we've, we've developed in the UK a very effective method for rewarding new plant. And that's naturally led those who are in the more common restock phase to query why that, that benefit for carbon goes that way. But I think hopefully we've explained the rationale for the carbon code and I think there's general consensus that's a good idea. The question is very moot though that we still have a process we've shown in the presentation all the benefits that that restock, restock sequestered carbon delivers through the processor onto Matt and his colleagues to make all these wonderful claims on, on embodied in a structured way. So the EPD in effect is the, the glue that holds everything together through that so we capture all those benefits. And I should say the EPD is also increasingly focused on issues of soil carbon and, and ensuring that we account for, for any loss there. In, in terms of developing a system for reward, tempting to think the market will take care of that if we can develop a system that involves uh, a scheme of benefiting through, if we're able to make a claim, it's, it's the offset question that we keep coming back to. At the moment, offset relates to Woodland Carbon Code. If we can find a mechanism where, as you said previously, um, Jamie, that we can make a tangible claim, we already make scientific claims against our cubic meter or linear meter of our product. If we can find a way perhaps with government to further encourage afforestation development of forest processing against the likely terms of the environment bill, you would imagine that that would evolve almost by default that you can't have a system where the majority of timber carries no effective monetary claim and a small percentage of new, the very much required new plant to increase our percentage cover carries the claim. So I think there is, that's, I think I was trying to highlight, that's the, the key natural tension that we have at the moment in carbon. And that's really, I think where, as you've hinted at, Confor's efforts will, will be one of the key focus for Comfort to look at and promote through Stuart some lobbying to that effect. But I don't want to say too much on that. I think, Jamie, you've said that it's it's a work in progress. Yes, uh, I, it, um, um, and going even further back in, in, in the uh, uh, life cycle, as it were, uh, again, several different questions relating to um, the when and 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 on what basis should we properly measure uh, whether to restock uh, forests which are, are currently growing on uh, on peaty soils? Uh, we have at the moment a sort of rather, to my mind, slightly arbitrary um, yield class eight um, sort of threshold. 
Um, do you think this is um, a right at the moment or, or do we need more work to understand what is possible given the improved performance of um, of the of the young trees we're now able to access? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a tricky one, Jamie. Again, you've got the improved yield class. I think the argument is, is certainly one that most astute foresters would, would say that we need to address. But equally, I think we all know that the concerns around peatland, focus on peatland restoration as opposed to planting on deep peat. We already have our agreement there on what is classified as deep peat. And if you look back at the slide on the Woodland Carbon Code, you can see the accompanying guidance includes peatland restoration, the peatland code. So I think we need to be very careful going back to this not damaging our reputation by being too greedy. We don't need to plant on deep peat. We need to respect these competing environments and recognize that timber is one element, but peatland restoration also has its place. So it's, it's, it's that balance between ensuring that our forest cover grows sufficiently, but targeting the habitats upon which we want to develop that forestry and not leave, leaving ourselves open to quite right some criticism that in the past, you know, in the past, the flow country argument and so on. So I think cognizance is there, Jamie, of the need to be extremely careful as we try and expand our our denuded forest base, that we do that pragmatically and carefully year on year. And certainly Vicky is, is well aware of that. Jamie, I, I would add to that, we need to be very careful here that um, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's very easy to say, you know, we're not going to go over 50 centimetres of peat. So we're really cautious and we go back to 25. But if that excludes a thousand hectares of land from commercial forestry, then one's got to think of the impact of that on a country that imports 82% of its timber, that suddenly that timber is coming in from um, Sweden, Finland, Russia, Latvia or wherever, and all the EPDs, you know, the, the, the cost of that in terms of the calculation that can be made for using that timber in a building at the end of the day. So we've got to be very, very careful that we don't exclude ourselves from planting timber. I say to people who are talking about conservation, oh, it's so good to plant with broad leaves because this, this is going to really help the environment. And they've had sick of there before, is remember that the tree you won't replace it with will have to be brought from Sweden, Finland or Latvia for the building that will be needed in the future. And, and, and just finally, Jamie, on that one, we have done some through CONFOR and forest research, some natural capital accounting to specifically look at that question as to if, if we look at how we account for natural capital, how do the cost benefit advantages of developing a, a well designed upwards woodland compare to leaving a, a denuded peatland or indeed restoring that peatland. So there's quite a lot of active work at the moment to address that. Yeah, I, th there's a, a lot of work going on, as, as you say, and I, th I think you know, David's comments in particular have, have very much covered the um, one one of the questions, which was, you know, do do younger trees capture carbon more more effectively and quicker than, than mature trees? And of course, that leads on to the the the, the, the often debated subject of of whether. You know, fast-growing conifers are, are, are better than than uh, native woodland o o over a, a very long lifetime. So, slightly um, moving moving subject sideways. Um, again, two or three questions have come in on um, whether or not we think that the, um, the the whole carbon story is affecting the. Um, market value of uh, forestry and and indeed of timber itself. Um, wh what about the back to uh, James Jones to for starters on on uh, the market um, for for forestry? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've, I've, I'm, I've got my polite hat on given who I'm sitting next to, but. I think I was hinting in the slides, Jamie, if you look at the disparity currently, 
between um, the return within the Woodland Carbon Code. And if you were down at three to four pounds a tonne per carbon, that's that's of interest. But when we start talking about 20, 25 pounds a tonne, again, basic sawmill or arithmetic tells you that the short answer to your question is yes. And that's really the point where we're trying to make is you don't want it skewing to the point where we're planting trees for carbon and the fact that we might get some wonderful construction timber ready for Matt and his very exciting plans becomes a, an afterthought. So short answer for once, yes, we're concerned that, that that skew is already, that bias is already in place and we need to work to address that. Yeah, I think I think um, something that Stephen's mentioned there, we put in a COM4 article the other day was the whole aspect of risk too, that you know, if you sell your carbon today, you only get that carbon tomorrow. And at least in a conifer wood, you've got something to pay for it if it all goes wrong. In a broadleaf woodland, if it fails after 80, 100 years, when it's only sequestered half that carbon, then you're probably going to go and have to go and buy a wind farm to pay back the London bus company or whoever you, you, you sold it to. So, you know, there's a great panacea here that you're going to get your money. But when you sign the form, as I did 20 years ago for a client in the north, saying, you know, we'll recover this if it all goes wrong, you've got to take some risk factor against that. And I think, you know, all these things need to be explained by Comfort to make people aware and assure this value doesn't go over the top and people are, are being led into it like they were led into forests in the flow country. 40 years ago. Yeah, and um, maybe if I just add, add into this, you know, so, you know, we can't, there, there is that risk of double counting, we can't be doing that, um, but we we can count the carbon once and hold it longer in, in, in the life cycle. So, you know, I think hopefully the, the, the point that I tried to make about the cumulative benefit of, of you know, gr growing and then harvesting uh, the, that resource and then holding that, you know, uh, well beyond the next uh, harvest, you know, it means that we're achieving that cumulative effect over time. Thanks, Matt. I, I was actually going to uh, ask you whether um, you are, free, as, a, as a user of, of this uh, enhanced product now, um, of, of, with everyone more aware of the credentials of timber, um, is that actually affecting uh, the price you are having to pay and making it more difficult to get you uh, get your substitution of other materials going in construction? Um, is, is there anything we we need to be doing to um, to you know to solve that to oil those wheels? Um, yeah, so I mean, we're we're seeing you know some significant uh, price fluctuations currently, obviously, but uh, but to to the extent that the the cost of our timber raw materials going up, uh, I'm I'm pleased to say that other more carbon intensive materials are uh, going up at, at at least the same rate of, uh, and and more. Um, so so you know I, I don't think that uh, will have a cumulative sort of negative effect but of course you know it, the, 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 there's there's a balance that, that needs to to be achieved but i think i think importantly for me the um you know the we we've always with a fabric first approach um you know we've always paid a, a premium for our building fabric and that's largely because we're achieving a higher performance therefore we, we need more material but you know this is where an off-site manufactured approach means that we've got less wastage through the entire process um, so that more of the client's budget ends up in the end in the resulting fabric more value is therefore uh, delivered to the client and more more value is is, is captured uh, within within that resulting asset uh, for, for longer and that's environmental value as well so um so you know, I, I I think this this can all only uh, only serve to 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 stimulate more demand for timber product. Uh, we we at the same time we do face challenges, and I know somebody made made a note about the sort of Grenfell and fire. You know, we we have we have a lot of disinformation that we have to counter, and that we have to try to counter with science rather than uh, you know there's there's some UK government making some significant uh, uh, knee jerk reactions on 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 you know trying to use. Uh, uh, timber as, as a bit of a, a scapegoat when it played no part uh, I'm glad to say in the Grenfell uh, tragedy so you know the the, the, the 
every time we get it get a positive there is something else that we need to contend with but it's about the awareness of raising uh, awareness raising and hopefully policy will shift towards uh, encouraging the use of of the natural resource you know france have made some some really um really compelling sort of decisions to uh, demand 50 percent of all new public buildings uh, are, are are prioritized in timber and you know uh, a homegrown timber for 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 france uh, is is a priority within that so you know i think there's there's an opportunity to respond to to the, to this current um sort of environment uh, by by seeing policy uh, change uh, you know really sort of support that and and influence that as well so anyway i'll i'll pause there otherwise i'll go on and on so well, yeah, it, I was going to follow that up with um, mentioning that next week in, in the uh, Scottish Forest and Timber Technologies webinar hosted by South Scotland, we are uh, going to be hearing how Dumfries and Galloway Council are going to achieve net zero by 2025. Mm -hmm. And I have already challenged them to adopt a timber, a, a timber first policy in any development that they choose to approve. And we'll see how they react to that in time. Anyway, um, time is drawing to a, a close. Um, uh, I think it. I should uh, um, hand back to to you, Will, to um, for some closing remarks. I appreciate we have not managed to cover everything that um, all the questions, um, but the presentations. Uh, uh, well, th this, as I said at the beginning, this event has been recorded uh, and the presentations and the recording will be available on the SFTT website um, shortly um, after after today. Uh, so back over to you, Will. OK, thanks, Jamie. Um, if I can just, uh, as Jamie said, bring this to uh, a close and, and thank in the first uh, instance you know, all of our speakers, uh, David, Steve and Matt, uh, some really good presentations there, lots of stuff to think about. Um, some things certainly I think from my point of view to take away just some points. Uh, as we all are aware, it's never a simple calculation um, in terms of carbon. There's lots of variables in there. But I like the comments that were coming out about trying not to either confuse uh, things. We've got a lot of good um, strengths. Don't overplay them. Um, we have to be open and transparent in the calculations that we're doing um, uh, and what we deliver through uh, the, the carbon benefits that we as an industry produce. Um, there's lots of um, uh, con uh, complex life cycle analysis to be carried out, uh, but we have a strong story in substitution for non-renewable materials. Um, picked up very strongly on the point that Matt made about uh, the, uh, the issue of disinformation. And I think we have to look to um, realistically and transparently counter that. And that will inevitably mean that as we, pro you know, as we progress through uh, the move towards this uh, inclusion of carbon in almost everything we do, that we have to continue to refine uh, our processes and develop these as our knowledge base increases. Um, I'm hoping that uh, what's been delivered tonight um, has certainly increased our knowledge base uh, and uh, once again, I'd just like to thank everybody involved in pulling this together and the hard work that you've seen have gone into these presentations. Uh, and also I'd like to thank all those who participated. Um, I think over 100 um, people attending uh, is probably a first, I think, for the, uh, the uh, North Scotland meeting. So thank you one and all. Um, and I'll draw the meeting to a conclusion there and uh, wish you all a, a safe and happy good night. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Thanks everyone, everyone, for attending and enjoy your safe home if you're travelling. Well done, Matt. <laughs> Cheers. Sounds like Andy. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I was just listening in the background. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it was good to get a presentation from you know, your part of the supply chain. So, but uh, yeah, I think 120 people. So that's 
having the the kind of digital side rather than just the physical obviously attracts even more so it's you get benefits when you get face to face and network, but um, we're getting people from halfway around the country there, which is which is positive. Well, but it's also potentially a bit um, dangerous too because <laughs> it's coming in from all angles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no. So th